Hello everyone and welcome to episode 13 of SSTO Space Program. Today we are launching a mission to study the Sun. The probe we are launching is inspired by a relatively recent NASA announcement regarding Parker Solar Probe. And not only that, but to celebrate another successful SpaceX launch, we will launch our spacecraft using a fully reusable two-stage rocket that will have very similar booster upper stage setup as Falcon 9. The rocket is full stock and has a maximum payload capacity to low carbon orbit of about 40 tons, which is way more than we need to launch our Parker Solar Probe replica with its transfer stage. Since KSP has some limitations regarding vessels in atmosphere, to recover both the booster and the upper stage we need to launch our rocket almost straight up, to buy us enough time to circularize. Because of that, we have a rather suboptimal launch trajectory but the main launch design remains pretty similar to what SpaceX is doing with the Falcon 9. Once we burn the fuel to around 1600 units in our booster stage, we detach the upper stage and begin circularizing immediately. We need to do it fast, because we want to get the upper stage in stable orbit before our booster stage passes its apoapsis. Depending on your launch profile, you should end up with the apoapsis between 85 to 95 km, and as you can see, due to rather suboptimal nature of this launch, the circularization burn is massive. We have enough fuel to do so, but we have little time for any mistakes, so it has to be done relatively quickly. Anyway, what we are aiming for is just a stable orbit, so we can leave our upper stage in, and uh, once it is achieved, we quickly switch back to the booster. Here I am uh, slowly finishing my circularization burn, getting rather nervous that uh, our booster is already passing its periapsis. But uh, even if it happens, it doesn't uh, really ruin our plan. So right now we just have to be worried about leaving our, uh, our uh, upper stage in uh, the most stable orbit. It doesn't have to be perfectly circular, but it has to be stable enough so we can switch to the booster and not worry about the payload. Right now our booster has just passed the upper apsis, so we're still good. We have enough fuel to perform a boost back burn to KC and obviously landing. I am going to use ScanSat map to help me figure out the boost back trajectory as map view compensates for planet's rotation so it's easier, but with enough experience you can do it in a fully stock game. Or even write your own KOS script to do that for you, that would be even cooler. The booster has some air brakes and control surfaces to imitate SpaceX grid fins, but no parachutes, so we will perform powered landing once we get closer to the ground. After performing the boost back burn, we have very little fuel to do it, so we actually have to do it almost SpaceX style, performing a suicide burn. It's not very easy in Kerbin, but it can be done, as uh, you are about to see, and it also carries some sense of achievement once you pull it off. Since stock SAS does a terrible job at stopping rotation, I kept it disabled until we were really close to the ground. At about 1 km altitude, or um, below 400 meters per second, you need to throttle up and slow down to safer velocities. At this point, you should be close to the ground and still have enough fuel to do two or three short bursts and land your booster. With our booster landed next to the runway, we can switch to the upper stage. Our vessel with the upper stage still attached is in low carbon orbit, so now it's a good time to detach it. Once we are done with the upper stage and have it safely on the ground, we will talk a little bit about the probe itself and the real mission this launch is going to mimic, our destination, craft design and the massive burn we need to perform. Right now, however, we need to deorbit and land the upper stage of our Pleiades reusable rocket. To add a little bit of realism and um, unnecessary difficulty too, probably, I didn't install reaction wheels, neither on the booster nor the upper stage, so you have to rely on RCS to control the attitude of the vessel. The transfer stage has a um, lot of extra fuel, but no heat shield, so your deorbit burn should be rather large, around 450-500 meters per second, if you want to avoid explosions during re-entry. This stage also has no parachutes, and similar air brakes cannot set up as the booster had, so your only option is powered landing. This was only done to mimic SpaceX design, but it can be easily modified if you wish. The craft file is, as usual, in the description. As we come in to land next to KC, we have a little bit more fuel left than the booster had and can afford more corrections if needed, but not too many. I also hope that this design satisfies the voices that were calling for reusable rocket design and complaining that we use only SSTO space planes. With both stages of our rocket on the ground, we can finally focus on the solar probe in orbit. As I mentioned earlier, the probe was designed after Parker Solar Probe, a mission announced recently by NASA that is aiming to study our sun. 
The probe was named after physicist Eugene Parker, who was pioneering solar wind studies and in fact predicted its existence in 1958. The launch is planned for 2018 and the primary mission objective is to study Sun's corona. To do that, the spacecraft will be placed in a highly eccentric orbit around the Sun with periapsis as low as 0.25 astronomical unit from the Sun, which translates to 3.9 million miles or 6.2 million kilometers. It is well below orbit of Mercury and several times closer than any other spacecraft in history. To withstand extreme heating that close to our star, the probe will be protected by a very thick 4.5 inch or almost 11.5 cm heat shield and is equipped with active cooling system too. It is expected that during its primary science time of 11 days, the spacecraft will face temperatures as high as 2500 degrees Fahrenheit or 1377 degrees Celsius. Our KSP replica will be put a bit closer to Kerbal as everything is smaller in stock Kerbal space program and we will aim at periapsis below 1 million kilometers, which classifies as low orbit around the Sun. The probe has similar dimensions as the real spacecraft, with the heat shield diameter of 2.3 meters, total probe length of around 3 meters and bus diameter of 1 meter. I've installed old stock experiments on the probe and some ScanSat antennas too, but what is more important is and interesting is um, the actual science equipment that will be on board of the real Parker probe. The spacecraft will be equipped with fields experiment that will make direct measurements of electric and magnetic fields and waves, pointing flags and absolute plasma density, electron temperature and spacecraft floating potential and radio emissions. Other experiment, named Integrated Science Investigation of the Sun, aims at studying highly energetic electrons, protons and heavy ions that are accelerated to energies between 10 to 100 kiloelectron volts in the Sun's atmosphere and inner heliosphere. Third experiment is called WISPA and stands for Wild Field Imager for Solar Pro. It is a telescope that will take images of solar corona and inner heliosphere. The researchers also hope to get images of solar winds, shocks and other structures as they approach and pass the probe. The experiment will be correlated with the reading from other two to provide more complete representation of Sun's activity. Last major experiment, abbreviated SWEEP, which stands for Solar Wind Electron Alphas and Protons Investigation, will focus on counting the most abundant particles in the solar wind, so electrons, protons and helium ions, and measure their properties such as velocity, density and temperature. There are still many unanswered questions about the sun, such as why the corona is hotter than the surface, and how and why exactly solar winds are generated, and this mission is aiming at providing some answers to those questions. It will also provide important insight and potentially pave way for an um, early warning system against solar flares. But even in KSP, our probe will need almost 90 days to reach periapsis of its solar orbit, so we have to leave it for now and move on to another mission. We have a contract that requires us to put another probe in solar orbit to map 9 asteroids that might pose threat to Kerbin. As of version 1.3 of Kerbal Space Program, this is a part of stock game, but before it was a contract that was introduced by an official mod called the Asteroid Day. As you could see, our probe is equipped with a dedicated Sentinel telescope and does not have any transfer stage, as we need only about 1.5 km per second of delta V to reach orbit between Kerbin and Eve, required by the contract. This time, we'll launch our probe using a Mark III SSTO space plane called Bumblebee. You might remember this vessel from my uh, building space station with SSTO video, and indeed it is a relatively small Mark III SSTO that is able to put 20 tons of cargo into low Kerbin orbit. This vessel has been slightly redesigned with um, some minor tweaks implemented, and since it is a fun and nimble plane, there is no reason not to use it. It has a high thrust to weight ratio and aerodynamic shape, and quite a lot of excess fuel, as it was initially designed as a space station building slash resupplying SSTO. Once we reached orbit, our probe was deployed, solar panels and antennas were activated and we could proceed with setting the maneuver nodes to reach our designated orbit. I calculated delta V requirements beforehand and we need a bit less than 1.5 km per second to position our satellite in orbit between Kerbin and Eve. Since our probe is really small and light, it was sufficient to add a couple of small fuel tanks and a powerful spark engine to get there. Unfortunately, we need to wait almost 200 days until our probe is ready to circularize, so this contract, worth over 220,000 credits, 
turned out to be a long-term investment. Nevertheless, we need money quick. As we are nearing Duna launch window and I am determined to launch a colony ship that would go there. Our last jewel launch left us with um, very little money and even more broke than the last time and we have about 20 days to restore our budget to be able to afford a Duna vessel. Recovering our SSTO will surely add to this, so let's deorbit it and as we are nearing KC I wanted to show you an experiment that might help us get a lot of money fast. The large truck you see is an experimental mining rover that I made which, if successful, might prove incredibly useful. Not only in our colonies on other bodies, but also here on Kerbin. We have just enough time to test it, so let's land the bumblebee and take a closer look at this truck. The rover weighs 30 tons when empty and is rather large, as you can see, equipped with six huge wheels. It is powered by a MKS nuclear reactor and has crew capacity of three kerbals, but is primarily designed to be operated autonomously. It has two large MKS drills as well for efficient mining and storage capacity of 48,000 units of various resources, depending on the container setup. That can be changed after the rover is launched as well. If this rover passes the tests here on Kerbin, I would like to send multiple rovers like this one to mine various resources in remote areas on the moon and using MKS logistics system provide our colonies with whatever they need to function properly. Here we will be testing it for mining exotic minerals, because as indicated by orbital scans there is a relatively high concentration of those, quite close to KC. This truck is also very fast, as you can exploit the differential steering system of large wheels to accelerate it to speeds well over 80 meters per second. I am not sure if driving a huge and heavy truck that fast is safe, but potential for explosions is definitely high. We need to drive it just over the hill, where concentration of exotic minerals rises to about 7.3%. It is high enough to provide some useful yield, I hope, and exotic minerals, a resource introduced by MKS, are as expensive as rare metals we are mining on Minmus. Using rare metals and exotic minerals and some chemicals, we can manufacture refined exotics, using MKS production plants, obviously, and definitely will need to do that in our off-world colonies. Here we'll focus only on mining and try to figure out how fast this is going and if all systems in our rover are working as expected. Upon arrival, drills were deployed and mining operations could begin. Mining and selling stuff that close to KSC always feels a bit cheaty, but I see no other option to get money we need for our Duna vessel. As an interesting side observation, there are now mineable resources available on the sea floor as well, so we could potentially make underwater bases on even lathe at some point. Apart from spaceships, I also love submarines, so I am particularly excited about this and I would love to hear your opinion on the subject. Would an underwater lathe or reef base be something you would like to see or not really? Tell me in the comments, please. As for our rover, nothing was overheating and we reached maximum throughput relatively quickly, so I switched to the rover that was deployed a couple of days ago and was happy to see that we are almost half full already. The amount of exotic minerals we had mined was worth almost 2 million credits, so we can assume that our financial problem has been solved for now. It doesn't mean, however, that we are foregoing contracts altogether. By all means, no. Our next mission was a geostationary satellite deployment and I would like to introduce yet another SSTO that I made for this purpose. This vessel you see right now has a maximum payload capacity of 20 tons and was designed as a high orbit SSTO. So with delta v of almost 3 km per second while in orbit, it can easily go to geostationary orbit and back. You could also send it to the moon or Duna, provided it can be refueled once landed and probably to Minmus as well without refueling. The ship was absolutely not inspired by the Tempest from Mass Effect Andromeda and I won't admit it as I did a terrible job recreating it. Nevertheless, overall shape is pretty okay looking in my opinion, except for the cockpit, which I absolutely hate. The ship flies surprisingly well and uh, has a very good pitch and roll response and overall is easy to get into orbit. The only downside, apart from awful cockpit, are aerodynamic unfriendly solutions for side airlocks that allow entering the vessel. The geostationary comm network we started building a couple episodes ago uh, hasn't been enlarged, so we will use this contract to put yet another American satellite in orbit. As last time, we need to position it over a specific spot on Kerbin's surface, and we will use scansat maps to help us predict the apoapsis position of our transfer orbit in reference to the surface. 
This was all pretty standard and I would say even simpler than in episode 9 as we could easily afford placing our SSTO in the geostationary orbit before deploying the satellite. Unlike last time we are not grabbing any satellites from orbit as old satellites have been recovered already. So our mission is really simple. So instead of filling you with all the details that you have seen already in episode 9, let's talk a little bit about what kind of ship we would like to send to Duna system. As far we have a bunch of contracts for Duna and Dyke, some more that needs to be transported and some surface outpost built. And obviously we have a contract to explore Duna as well. We can send quite a lot of stuff to Duna using Flame Leviathan, which is still in low carbon orbit. Or we could send multiple vessels at once and create a quasi-permanent outpost on Duna and Dyke right away. I would love to hear your suggestions, but as far as I'm concerned, I would like to send at least two bases, or maybe three, to Duna. If we decide to use ground construction mode, we can send some of the stuff pre-packed and build the stations once we land. But we also could do it the same way I made the man and minimus bases and not use any construction mods at all. The decision is entirely up to you. It goes without saying that we are also sending a space station to Duna and maybe a replica of a real space mission to Mars. So I'm waiting for your suggestions. With this, I would like to thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed the video and um, that little extra bit about the Parker Solar Probe. And if you did, please consider giving this video a like. All your support means a great deal to me, especially with all the craziness that is happening on YouTube recently. So thank you very much for watching. My name is Mark Frim and I will see you next time. Cheers.